Whenever there's a celebrity who needs to hawk a movie, a scribbler who has a book to flog, or a politician who has a war to unload onto a skeptical public, you will usually find them talking to a middle-brow sycophant throwing softball questions for up to an hour at a time. Who is this idiot? None other than Charlie Rose. Rose, a celebrated interviewer, has a personal net worth estimated at $23 million. The son of North Carolina tobacco farmers, he has homes in North Carolina, New York, Washington DC, and Paris, and is featured in several mainstream Hollywood films as himself. He is seen by his peers, absurdly, as an intellectual heavyweight and a serious journalist. In a profile of Rose by WBTV, his television colleague Nora O'Donnell gushes. He's the hardest working man in journalism. His dedication and hard work comes from a deep sense of curiosity and engagement with the world. He knows so much. His intellect, sure, but also his ability to allow himself to be vulnerable enough to question. If Rose is a journalist, it certainly doesn't show in any particular knowledgeability. However, as a powerful public figure, Rose has no difficulty in drafting the biggest names, the leading celebrities, and the top intellectuals. And the advantage of his program is that the 40-minute length circumvents the usual requirement for concision, allowing complex issues to be discussed. And this occasionally does allow interesting ideas to be heard. And occasionally, as in his interview with Larry David, his guest is interesting enough to force him to be better than he is. It's striking then that Rose is such a force for orthodoxy. For example, in a celebratory piece written for Fortune magazine titled Why Business Loves Charlie Rose, it is noted that the show was the major program where business leaders had a chance to talk about the economic crisis after the credit crunch. It also noted in passing that Rose's most frequent guest was the New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, who's been on the show 65 times. Those who are familiar with Friedman's distinctive blend of business apologia, pro-war and pro-Israeli sentiment, and racism will perhaps raise an eyebrow. But this is characteristic of the overwhelming burden of Rose's program, which is to provide a venue where the already rich, already powerful, and already widely heard can speak at even greater length. Consider Rose's fondness for the decrepit war criminal Henry Kissinger. In a notable recent interview with Kissinger, Rose begins by reciting Kissinger's various credentials, not failing to mention the absurd Nobel Peace Prize he received, having bombed both Vietnam and Cambodia, and played a decisive role in the Chilean military coup. Of course, Rose mentions none of that, and nothing that would stink of controversy. With such an ingratiating introduction, Rose adds warmly, I am pleased to have Henry Kissinger back at this table. Welcome. It's good to see you. Good to be here. He asks no adversarial questions, offering only polite inquiries to Kissinger to expand on his humdrum academic ideas. This idea of order has permeated your academic, public, post-public life. It has been this concept of that, that you seem to have be at the core of how you see the world. That Kissinger might have more pressing questions to answer, for example, before a war crimes court, simply didn't come up. In fact, Rose seems to adopt the same approach to any establishment figure whom he interviews. Consider the approach he takes to Thomas Friedman, his most prized guest. Friedman, expounding upon what he called the terrorism bubble, according to which he alleged that the US had been overly tolerant of terrorist threats in the previous decade, asserted in familiar Friedmanite mixed metaphor that 9-11 had been the peak of that bubble. And what we needed to do was go over to that part of the world, I'm afraid, and burst that bubble. We needed to go over there, basically, um, and um, uh, take out a very big stick um, right in the heart of, of that world and, um, and burst that bubble. And there was only one way to do it, because part of that bubble said, we've got you. This bubble is actually going to level the balance of power between us and you because we don't care about life. We're ready to sacrifice, and all you care about are your stock options and your Hummers. And what they needed to see was American boys and girls going house to house from Basra to Baghdad um, and basically saying, which part of this sentence don't you understand? Rose's response to this barely literate, grubby barroom rant posing as hardened real politic wisdom, 
was simply to continue with his polite inquiries. It becomes worse when Rose is dealing with a politicized celebrity whom he admires. His 2013 interview with Bono, conducted in a kitchen environment with his shirt collar unbuttoned, was an embarrassing love-in in which Rose was eager to treat Bono as an old friend whom he could exchange laughs with. As Bono expatiates on his free market, tax-avoiding solutions to poverty, Rose restricts himself to gentle questioning about Bono's personal mission. Where does it come from within you? Often these interviews are simply a venue in which Rose can champion his own views. In an interview with the right-wing philanthropist and pro-Israel fundraiser Seth Klarman, Rose avers that Israel is under siege like it's never been since 1948, when in fact Israel was being founded on the wreckage of an ethnically cleansed and colonized Palestine in 1948, and invites Klarman to comment. When Israel is singled out like no other country, Klarman replied, it recalls the slow march of Hitler. Nor is it just that he avoids controversy when courting establishment political figures. When dealing with business leaders, he is effusive with praise, respectful and incurious. He was able to interview industrial leaders like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs without offering any serious adversarial questioning, merely politely urging them to explain their tremendous success. About Gates, he offered that this firm, Microsoft, was perhaps the most successful company, the most dazzling new industry of the century. Or consider when he interviews the liberal billionaire philanthropist Warren Buffett, prefacing the entire interview with a reminder that Buffett is his friend. All too often one suspects, if these powerful individuals are not his friends, he seems to wish they were. However, perhaps the clearest ways in which the program proves its adherence to orthodoxy is in those few moments where unconventional thinking is admitted to the Charlie Rose program. In each case, Rose moves quickly to put the bad thoughts back in the box. Now, this is particularly clear where he deals with opponents of US wars. For example, when he interviewed Democracy Now!'s Amy Goodman in March 2003, he asked her what an independent media would bring to the table. In a time of war, we need independent reporting. I, I, well, I don't know what independent means, and independent in contrast to what? It need, means not being sponsored by the corporations, the networks like NBC, CBS, ABC, NBC owned by General Electric, or CBS owned by Viacom no. or Disney's ABC. Uh, just as a mo moment of sort of, I, my point would be in response to that is that uh, we do need you. Uh, because you bring a quality of reporting and a quality of broadcasting and, and more people ought to have access to the media and there ought to be uh, more voices reporting. Having said that, I promise you, CBS News and ABC News and NBC News are not influenced by the corporations that may own those companies since I, I know one of them very well and work for one of them. What a relief to have it from the horse's mouth. Of course, part of Rose's peak may have been informed by the fact that he was in favor of the Iraq war, as he demonstrated in an interview with Noam Chomsky of MIT. I talked to someone else, knowing that you were coming in, and they said, you know, I was, in Egypt, I was in Iraq recently, recently, and I met no Iraqi who said the war was a mistake. Rose acknowledged that many Iraqis may have opposed the occupation, but said that they did not oppose the idea of overthrowing Saddam. Of course, as Christopher Hitchens once wrote of a journalist who made the mistake of tangling with Chomsky, he walked straight into the propellers and was distributed into many fine particles. I'm not going to be able to answer the question because the assumptions are wrong. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the United States was not in favor of overthrowing Saddam Hussein. In fact, George Bush made that explicit. He said, the, well, sorry, no, the, no, you're at right, the right. Azor summit, a couple of days before the invasion started, uh, Bush and Blair uh, were there, and they issued a declaration in which Bush said, even if Saddam Hussein and his family leave the country, we're going to invade anyway. Notably, in this, as in many similar interviews with left figures, Rose interrupted constantly, a stark contrast to his style in handling establishment figures whom he admires. Rose takes a similar approach in his discussion with the economists Richard Wolff and David Harvey about the crisis of capitalism in 2011. After more than a quarter hour of unrelenting critique of American capitalism, Rose finally fought back with a pointed note of concern trolling. Is there a state, a state that represents the values that you would like to see reflect in the United States? Uh, what would you say, for example, of Cuba? 
as if to ensure that the debate can only ever be between an impoverished garrison state that has survived half a century of economic sanctions and the US model of capitalism. The problem with Rose's program is not that occasional flashes of truly interesting material don't escape. For example, the program on the legacy of Hugo Chavez, while clearly stacked in favor of Chavez's opponents, did allow the historian and writer Greg Grandin to knowledgeably and efficiently rebut his opponents. And in other circumstances, Rose has interviewed Michael Moore, Naomi Klein, and a host of figures who would hardly be counted among the establishment. The problem is that Rose's journalism is set up in such a way with such an overwhelming reliance on received opinion and the reflected glory of celebrity that it cannot help but be ingratiating to the rich and powerful and aggressive and chippy with their opponents. At long last, the sheer intellectual vividity behind the sober intellectual pretensions of Rose's on-screen personality has been dramatized in a little-known three-minute drama entitled Charlie Rose by Samuel Beckett in which the man interviews himself. This, in a way, is what he's been doing for some time.